Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Sharon Sung. I am head of commercial at uh, Estex. Just to give you a quick introduction to Estex, if you're not familiar with us, we are a digital and investment trading platform with two licenses from the MAS. We hold the CMS license as well as the RMO license, and we operate a private blockchain exchange. We are focused exclusively on private markets and investments within the private market space. In the last five years, we've actually raised more than 300 million on the platform. And our goal is to provide institutional grade investments to a wider investor pool. So um, without much further ado, I'd like to kick off this webinar and invite our two panelists to first introduce themselves. Um, let's start with um, Ashley, who's from Southworth. Ashley, could you um, give a short introduction of yourself, please? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Yeah, this is Ashley. I'm from Southworth Asset Management. I look after the Global Currency Fund here, where we trade the G10 currency pairs and gold. We do systematic trading in this space. Uh, we are a regulated fund manager based here in Singapore, and we serve accredited investors only, including private wealth individuals. Uh, institutional clients and family offices. Uh, the main motivation for us behind this fund would be to uh, promote FX as an asset class and to educate investors uh, regarding the adding of alternatives into their investment portfolio. Yeah, Thank over you. to you, Gary. Yeah. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Gary? Yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, welcome to the webinar. My name's Gary Dugan. I'm a 40 year veteran of the financial services industry, uh, typically in chief investment officer roles in recent years, um, at companies like JP Morgan, Merrill Lynch, uh, for the global financial crisis, uh, and, and many other market environments that I've worked in. I now run an outsourced CIO services business, which in essence means that we give advice to single multifamily offices and small wealth management businesses around the world, uh, providing advice on how to invest in markets and giving very independent advice uh, to our clients. That's great. Thank you, Gary. Um, well, I think we'd like to just um, quickly kick off um, the session. So just a very quick um, housekeeping. Um, you will see at the bottom of the panel that you have a Q&A tab. So we ask you to you know, post any questions that you have um, on within that tab, and we will address and come to your questions at the end of the uh, of the webinar. So next slide, please. So let's just quickly start. I think, um, you know, we are really, everyone here, who's here tonight is very interested to understand, um, you know, the global currencies landscape and basically, you know, as the title suggests, how to navigate it, right? So to kick off, I think we'd like to obviously hear the views from our, our two panelists on, you know, what exactly is, you know, your views on the macro environment and what is the market outlook? And maybe we'd like to start with um, Gary first to give share some of your views. Yes, thank you. Um, obviously, we're living in um, what always seem like very difficult times. I think the last decade has been marked by ups and downs and many a challenge. But the, the things that we're going to particularly focus on uh, this evening uh, talk more to this problem we've got of global growth, which has continued to be stronger than expected, uh, creating inflation pressures around the world. And that's where the central banks have been very lively, increasing interest rates. But that inflation is still not weakening fast enough, in our view. And I think we'll see more tightening of monetary policy in the future, which will bring about some kind of slowdown in global growth. And then only then might we see that inflation is beaten. So on the next slide, I've got a couple of lines on this chart. One is to show um, the degree to which economic data is above or below expectations on two factors. One is inflation, which is the dotted line that you see in front of you. And the other blue line is for growth. So a rising line means that the data is coming in stronger than expected. A falling line says that um, the data is weaker. So the, the, the dotted line is emphatically up and doesn't want to come down. And although we're not getting the same really strong surprises in inflation that we saw through the previous 12 months, it's still up there and it's still problematic. And also on growth, although growth has been somewhat weaker than um, many people might have hoped for, 
Um, but for the consensus, growth is really in line with expectations. And central bankers would have expected by now that growth would have been far weaker, bringing those inflation pressures down and therefore giving the central banks um, an opportunity, not just to pause as the Fed is doing at the moment, but maybe that they could then argue that interest rates are peaking. But our view, view is that global growth is going to remain relatively robust and that our inflation rate will remain sticky at levels uncomfortable for central bankers. On to the next slide. Um, just to break the world up into two big areas, I'm going to start with the United States. And you can see that there are a number of factors um, that are, are at play here. One is the labor market, the momentum of growth, and you know, to what degree are we starting to see the softness that might get the Fed thinking that we're going to have a period of peaking interest rates and coming down. Well, the labor market is still solid. The um, numbers that you see for employment, um, if you can see that little gray tick, is still above the 50 level, suggesting that people are still hiring across the United States. For certain, new orders are coming down. And also we've seen some of the price inflation pressures come out of the US economy, but core inflation still remains problematic. And you see a lot of data in your headlines, which references the manufacturing sector in the United States, but manufacturing is only 10% of the economy. The other 85, 90% is the service sector. And in the service sector, with that gray line on the right-hand side above the 50 level, we still have an expansion of growth, an expansion of this sector, and therefore that's what's giving a liveliness to inflation and creating conditions where growth will not weaken fast enough for the Fed and inflation will remain elevated. On to the next slide. Turning our vision now to Asia, the sad thing is what happened between May and June. And you look in May, you can see lines that are going up. And this is the degree to which um, economic growth data is coming in above expectations. And a particularly strong one, as China opened up, that orange line, China opened up and gave a really big surprise during the first few months of the year on growth. Unfortunately, as we see in the headlines in newspapers and probably again tomorrow, China has been weakening. It's not gone below that zero line, but it's still at a weak point. And unfortunately, the policymakers have been slow to react. So it, the, I think Asia, which had been hoping for a good follow through of growth from China, has really not seen it. And emerging markets in general are now uh, you know, kind of bouncing around with little momentum in terms of growth. And that's a disappointment for both Asia and for the global economy. And on the next slide, just um, what does that mean for global growth forecasts? Well, these lines look pretty flat, don't they? They're not really saying very much. But what they are telling us is that there's been no extra momentum to global growth. So the, the outstanding country this year has been India, which is still running at a growth rate around 7%. China's growth rate at one point was being upgraded, but has now been downgraded. It looks like a 5% handle on that number. And the rest of the world is bouncing around at numbers of ones and twos, um, you know, nothing like the threes and fours that we've seen in the past. So we've got an environment where growth is not great, where it still remains too robust for the policymakers. And that's why we're seeing increase in interest rates, even in the absence of outstanding growth. And on the next slide, we've um, just a, a little bit of data on China. And you can see that that loss of momentum was virtually across the board. On the right-hand side there is the breakdown of the pace of growth of industrial production. They're very, very small numbers and often negative. So the only two standouts for the economy was the new economy, the new economy of solar panels, solar batteries, and the electric vehicles, where the year-on-year -year and month-on-month -month growth rates have been pretty outstanding. But sadly, for the majority of the economy, it's been weaker. And that's led to growth forecasts that have come down from 6.5% to 6% and probably on their way to 5 And on to the next slide, um, this is the inflation problem. And I'm picking up my old country of the UK. Um, over the next couple of days, they're going to announce their inflation uh, for the past month. And you've got you know, a, a, an old economy in the UK that's still running an inflation rate that's close to 6 or 7%, a central bank that's going to be increasing interest rates. And even in the United States, with that blue line, uh, which is the core PCE deflator, which is the, preserve, um, is the deflator, or the, I should say the inflation signal that the central bank most looks at, 
it's still going at a good pace of growth around about 5%. So although the central bank has been increasing interest rates, that inflation for inflation target that they look for is 2% on that number, not five, and it's not coming down. So that's why the Fed um, has been increasing interest rates. It's paused just to see how things are going. But I think the market's right to expect at least another increase in interest rates um, over the course of the next few months. And on to um, one other factor, just to bear in mind, even if inflation comes down, that doesn't mean that pipeline inflation has disappeared. And the reason I mentioned the word pipeline is that a lot of people's concerns about long-term inflation is about a spike in wage inflation. And in the United States, you see that that line, that blue line, which is the level of unemployment, is now back down to the levels that we saw in 1969. So we have not seen such low inflation for decades, sorry, low in unemployment rates for decades, which means that if you're a central banker, you're concerned that we're going to see elevated wage inflation because there are shortages of workers. Now, this number may tick up a fraction, but Ben Bernanke, a former central banker, said recently that the United States unemployment level would need to get to 4.5% or more before you could believe that you've beaten inflation. So still a challenging economy, still the need to bring down growth, and still an unemployment number that needs to go higher before we bring inflation down. And on to the next slide. Um, maybe we'll go to the next one because I think it's um, just more valuable. So, um, you know, so how has the market interpreted this? Because this is where we kind of segue into um, currencies because currency movements up and down at least reflect the way which people perceive interest rates to be moving in an economy. And the United States has seen a significant repricing recently. So let me just, just start with the chart at the bottom there. If you go back to April the 28th, the market expected interest rates to go up very modestly and then to come down in the United States. The bars show the change in the Fed funds rate in the perception of the market over the next, let's call it uh, next nine months. Now contrast that with where we are today. On June the 19th, yesterday, we had an expectation priced into the market of, you know, 25, 50 basis points more on interest rates and only coming down very slowly. And indeed, in a year from now, at the same level as they are today. So that's a very, very big change. And we're getting these changes, you know, this kind of volatility in the currency markets more than we've seen for some time as people keep repricing the way in which central bankers will uh, change their view um, relative to the last policies they set out and relative to their expectations that they maybe have got that inflation problem under control. And, uh, and then finally, um, to say that that change in expectations on interest rates has been a phenomenon for the last 18 months. So even though you look at that previous chart and say, well, okay, but now the market's kind of got it. Well, maybe the market still hasn't got it because it, it never got it for the previous uh, one to two years. They've been upgrading the level of expected interest rates uh, for the peak in interest rates for some time. So the dotted line says that in the case of the UK, back in March of this year, they thought that interest rates would peak at four. Now, now they're saying five and a half. In the case of the US, again, it was 3.75 at the beginning of this year. Now the peak in interest rates was expected to be around five, but it's going on towards five and a half. So don't expect the market's got it completely right. They keep repricing this. So bottom line from this presentation on the macro picture, Growth is still too robust, inflation is still too high, and central bankers still have a lot to do, which will play out, I think, in good volatility to be exploited in currency markets. Um, and I think we've got one more slide to finish. Back to you. Great, thanks. Thanks for that overview, um, Gary. Um, I guess this is a good segue for us to try and think about those implications, right? Because we all know that currencies are very much linked to in interest rate policies for each of those countries. And I think um, this is a good sp uh, spot for us to ask uh, Ashley, you know, as a consequence of that, you know, what, what are some of the views you have on the outlook for currencies? Yeah. 
Thanks, Sharon and Gary, for that detailed sharing. So I think just in addition to Gary's point, I think it's yeah, it's clear that the clear the concern here of all central banks and Fed would be the very uh, stubborn inflation that we have seen. And that would definitely uh, weigh on all the currency outlook, uh, especially for this year. So let's talk about the dollar outlook. I think overall, we are currently bearish, right? Because um, I think we just had a rate pause in June. And right now, markets are pricing in two more, at least till end of the end of this year. And as to Gary's point, we will only be cutting rates uh, in 2024. So I think overall, what we are seeing here now is um, prices are now holding below a key resistance level of 105. And that actually sit uh, right at the descending price uh, trend line as well. And we see that there could be a support at the 101 level. So overall, I think uh, given the persistent inflation rate and the need to be higher for longer, we are right now uh, bearish on dollar. Okay, uh, next on Euro. So I think on the back of a uh, Fed surprise last week, we did see another surprise uh, from ECB where the rates hiked by 25 basis point as well. Uh, that is despite signs of uh, moderating inflation in the Eurozone and, and also deteriorating uh, growth uh, figures. So markets are pricing in another rates high in July and we expect continued uh, hawkishness by ECB into the next year. So with inflation as the top concern, we see that uh, if price maintained above 1.07, we are bullish right here. And that sits nicely at that ascending uh, channel here, right? And we expect potential upside to 1.16 as the next resistance level. Yeah, okay. On pound, it has uh, been outperformer this year. Right, we have seen right now at levels 1.28, and that is uh, uh, what we have, uh, that is uh, climb, it has climbed to basically uh, a fresh one year high this year. Okay, so UK has been a lot more resilient than expected. Uh, same as US, we have seen very strong labor growth, um, but the, the inflation numbers have been a lot more persistent at 8.7, uh, which is the highest amongst all the uh, major economies. So with that, uh, with uh, the prime minister has also uh, came out strongly to say that they are going to bring inflation down. So with that, uh, we're expecting uh, at least four more rates hike into next year. So uh, we are bullish on pound, uh, with upside to one point three level. Yeah. Overall on commodities, uh, given that the Chinese recovery hasn't. Um, been too encouraging in the past few months, we've seen that the prices have been uh, quite depressed. And as for Aussie-wise, uh, there has been a rally lately given RBA delivered a surprise uh, rate tight as well uh, very recently. I think since last year till now, it has already increased by about 400 basis points. So uh, it's quite near terminal peak rate of 4.5%, currently it's about 4%. So uh, overall, I think we, have, we see very limited upside. Uh, to this resistance level of about 0 0.7. Uh, but overall, we are, we are bullish on Aussie. Yeah. And as for Kiwi, uh, just very recently, the Central Bank of New Zealand has uh, signaled that they are at the end of their uh, tightening. So, um, uh, I mean, on balance, given that if dollar is still gonna, if, still, if they still have more room to raise rates, and compared to uh, uh, New Zealand, who have repost their rates, I think overall we are we are a bit more bearish on Kiwi, um, and it's also right now trading near the resistance level of about zero point six two. So uh, we see support at about zero point six one for for Kiwi. Yeah, and as for gold, um, we have a lovely <laughs> love hate relationship with it. Uh, just last year, we actually incorporated this instrument into our fund, given that we've seen uh, volatility in, you know, euro, pound and yen uh, reaching levels that we've not seen for the past 20 to 30 years. So here at Southworth, we do uh, mostly uh, systematic trading, where we use technical strategies uh, to generate our data sets. So when prices are too extreme, that is when uh, we get a bit more uncomfortable. So actually last year, we rotated a lot more of our positions into, uh, into gold itself. 
And that was also the main contributor to our double digit growth uh, last year. But then uh, with what we've seen this year, um, the mini bank crisis in March, right, with SBB and Credit Suisse not down, and then subsequently in May with um, the debt ceiling concerns, uh, when price uh, reached 2000, uh, again, breaking new highs, that's when we got uh, very uncomfortable again. So uh, we start to reduce uh, our positions in gold. Uh, but I'd say overall, we are bullish uh, definitely in gold, given that central banks are currently buying a lot of gold as a diversification move. And also, I think with China coming in with the stimulus package, uh, second half of, of the year, we would expect uh, a pickup in demand, right? local demand, and there would definitely be more uh, more spending uh, happening, more spending on jewelries, people getting married, right? Even even my mom just called me, you know, asking me, should I buy go now? Yeah, maybe she's hinting me to get married. But I think overall, we are very uh, bullish on go uh, at levels above 190, 190 1950 uh, with upside to 2000 levels. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks, Ashley. Actually, um, actually, since we're on currency pairs, we actually did have um, a question from the audience asking sure. about um, the Sing Dollar Aussie pairing specifically. Um, I know this was not in your set of slides, but wondering mm. if there's anything you could um, comment on briefly? Uh, we don't really look at Sing Dollar actually for our trading, okay. um, but Sing Dollar trades uh, quite differently, right? It doesn't it's not very um, implicitly uh, based on certain interest rate decisions, more on um, the exchange rate. But I would think um, with dollar, since we're bearish on dollar, I think overall we're, we're more bullish on SING. Yeah, right. So that would affect yeah, the outlook. Okay, great. Thank you for that. So what, I mean, when we look at this, um, what do you think are the implications for investors generally? And how should investors think about the asset allocation um, strategy. But Gary, maybe you can uh, take this first. Yeah, let me just spend a couple of minutes here. There's lots of bullet points, but just in broad terms, um, last year you had a terrible year for investors in just general portfolios with traditional assets. And the main thing you have to take away is that both bonds and equities fell together, which means that there was a lack of diversification in a very typical old style way of building portfolios. Both bonds and equities went down together. And unfortunately, as we've seen for much of this year, they've also gone up together, which means that um, they are still highly correlated. Um, the second point I'd make is that the returns on fixed income markets are now much more healthier. So people are turning away from um, leaving their money, um, doing nothing in some assets that uh, have been acquired. Um, largely because cash is better and fixed income uh, returns are better. But I think those fixed income returns are still not adequate given the inflation. So let me just put a couple of charts on that and then come back to this point that absolute return strategies, such as Ashley's and other types of strategies that look to make a, a positive return for investors, could be a kind of secret weapon against this lack of diversification in traditional assets. So first slide, um, um, which we can show next is, is a, a picture of um, Bloomberg, but the green area you see there is the more recent experience of the positive correlation between equities and bonds. So traditionally, you would get the red area, which means that bonds go up and equities go down, and you get a return that comes somewhere between the two. So you can protect yourself from the downside. In current market conditions, with the current characteristics of bonds and equities, you don't get that downside protection. And on the next slide, um, the, the point I'd make about bonds is that 3.5% bond yield sounds attractive, 3.8% sounds attractive. But remember, you've still got inflation around the world of somewhere between 4 and 7%. So you're still not getting a real yield. You're not getting an improvement in, the, um, in your spending power. So if you've got low inflation and high returns, your spending power gets stronger because you're becoming wealthier. In current market conditions, if you invest in the long bond, you're not getting that. So I'd like to see that 10-year bond yield well above 4% before it becomes particularly attractive. And on to the next slide, and that's my bond story. You see that uh, blue line is the bond yield minus the inflation. You're basically losing spending power by sitting in bonds. And on to the next one, um, 
And so what's the answer? Well, one of the uh, interesting asset classes at the moment for us is absolute return strategies. Now, the problem is that not all absolute return strategies can do well if they don't have an opportunity. But the blue line is showing you that currency strategies around the world are now showing some of the sharpest improvement in returns that we've seen for some time. And Ashley will tell you more about what, how her, her team have been exploiting this. But what we're saying is that at a time when both bonds and equities could still be positively correlated, they could both go down together if you have an environment of a recession and interest rates that go higher than we expected. Maybe in that currency market, there's great opportunities to be exploited. And the recent experience we've been seeing would be a very big positive behind those types of strategies. And that's talking uh, independently of Ashley's pitch, because we're clearly looking for the long-term trends and how to position your portfolio for current market conditions. So, yeah, so Gary, I, I know you already touched on the importance of um, looking towards uh, absolute return as um, as uh, in, you know investment strategy. But how does that, I think um, it would be good for the audience to understand how they can include currencies as part of their portfolio. Though. How do they actually think about it and how, do, how would they go about doing that? Because if they're new to currencies, um, what's the best advice that you know, we, uh, we can give them, um, I think, Ashley, maybe you can help us out here. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks, Gary, for that. Uh, uh, I need to buy a beer. That's a good segue into <laughs> my section. Yeah, so um, here we like FX because FX is um, it's a very liquid instrument, right? Every day, there's about five to six trillion of liquidity, which easily dwarf the equity and the bond markets. So FX itself is a very evergreen type of instrument I'll say that it's a lot less uh, cyclical than, say, equities, which tends to go through certain periods of like um, bear markets or bull market, where FX itself is just less seasonal. So it is definitely possible to kind of uh, aim for positive returns on a year-on-year -year basis. And also to Gary's point earlier, um, equities and bonds have shown increasingly high correlation. And you know, especially, I would say, for Asian investors who and Singaporeans who typically hold you know, properties, uh, the HDB or condos, and then the next one they will have in their portfolio is usually stocks and equities and bonds. Um, it's still correlated already, and you do need something that kind of allows you to effectively diversify that risk. right? So last year, I do recall, I have quite a few clients who got margin caught, and that's when they realized um, their portfolio is too correlated. And you know when they tried to free up some cash flow, uh, to kind of get liquidity for a portfolio, that's when they felt that they got a bit jammed, right? They're unable to sell that property overnight and they kind of had to scramble to find new liquidity. So I think another big part of uh, why, why you would like to add FX into your portfolio is also on the liquidity part, where FX is a very, very highly liquid instrument and having this in your portfolio will definitely add um, fluidity in your investments. Yeah, so this point um, for investors who are new to FX and want to consider having this in their investment, uh, we see a lot of people will try uh, their hands on trading, right? Opening a brokerage account and then try to trade themselves. So, of course, uh, uh, the point I'm trying to drive here is, of course, leave it to the pros. We'll manage for you uh, for a small fee. But then uh, if you want to try FX yourself, uh, please, I think uh, risk management is the top concern, uh, especially in today's very volatile market. And you could really just lose everything if you're not careful in your trading plans. So I'd say if you want to really try to invest in FX, uh, please start small. Maybe just try demo trading first and just get yourself familiarized with you know, the trading interface. Uh, every broker would have a different type of trading GUI, uh, trading interface. So get yourself familiarized with that. Um, understand how to put in the trading positions, limit orders, stop loss, take profit levels. And then after that, move yourself to a live trading account. And also ensure that you stick to your trading plans throughout, right? A lot of, I think, uh, where people fail is really the human emotion part of it, where you tend to cut loss too late, despite already having that levels there, you tend to adjust the level or you take profits too early. So try to stick to your trading plan. And, and yeah, just look after your risk. I would think um, that's a good start for, for people who are new to FX. But of course, yeah, just leave it to the pros. <laughs> So are there, are there emerging trends or techniques that make, you know, make it more effective or more you can sort of uh, 
trade or invest with more certainty, given that we are still living in quite uncertain market conditions? Yeah. Um, so in a very volatile market environment, I would actually advise uh, traders or investors to actually um, employ algorithm, algorithms uh, in your trading. Uh, this is to ensure a more effective uh, execution in your positions. So as a, you know, if you are just a manual trader, you tend to be, you know, you, you need to monitor and um, you know, monitor your trades, uh, you know, 24 seven. So it's a bit hard, right? You need to eat, you need to sleep, you need to attend SDX webinar and, you know, having an, an algo in place that allows you to be uh, monitor markets uh, uh, for 24, 24, six and allow you to be a bit more precise as well in terms of your trade entry and trade exit. Uh, as a, if you're just a manager trader, you would possibly only be able to monitor effectively two to three instruments, but using, uh, again, uh, automation algorithms, you will be able to trade more instruments as well. So I, I think the big part of that, it's really also on uh, having a very uh, disciplined approach to your risk management. So um, yeah, I would strongly, uh, you know, encourage clients, uh, sorry, investors to kind of um, explore using algorithms in their trading. Gary, would, do you have something to add towards that? Because, I mean, you've been in the investment se sector for like 40 years, right? So aside from, you know, anybody amongst us who are actually able to code and create an algorithm for ourselves, I mean, how else would you weigh in on that um, thinking? Yeah, so, so two thoughts. Um, I have to say in my whole career that this is the one space where an individual does it on their own and I, and they lose profound amounts of money. Um, I, I, I just say Marina Bay Sands might be great and fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you may lose less because it's a, a more controlled environment. So yeah, I wouldn't do it yourself. And remember, you are competing with some great brains out there with the algorithms, with all sorts of technology and capabilities at their hand, um, managing uh, money in this space. I used to work at JP Morgan, tremendous track record over a decade, but you know, a team of 10, 20 people. The second point I'd make though, is that I think the, um, the currency markets at the moment are, are kind of almost coming back from the dead in terms of being able to interpret longer term trends. Remember when, when every central bank had zero interest rates, it was quite difficult to, to make some grand prediction about the way in which things might shift and to get more predictive uh, movements in the currency market. So I think there's a greater opportunity to be exploited by professional managers in this space. And that's why I, you know, earlier you heard my comments that I think this is a good area for absolute returns in coming, uh, at, least, at least in the coming year. Right. So I think um, some of the thinking out there may be that Forex is more for trading as opposed to long-term investments. Um, you know, do you agree with that, um, Gary, before I throw this to Ashley? Of course, it's a tough question. I, I, I think there are, I think there's some currencies you might, I'm, again, I'm talking my own thoughts here. Um, the yen, you, it's 142 today. You're going, you know, that's a country that's coming back from the dead virtually. And it's a currency that I think that's going to react positively when um, the policies of the central bank change from being very, very loose monetary policy to tighter. So that's, for me, is a profound change that you could see a good measure of long-term return from. But otherwise, no, it's, it's still a market that has to be traded, very, very short-term views that have to be exploited. Taking long-term views sometimes takes a long time to actually get the return for the view that you've got. Thank you, Gary. Um, Ashley, would you like to add? Yeah, to I think just chiming on that. Um, here, for our fun, at least what we are doing here, it's uh, systematic trading. So we are all uh, model-driven. Uh, we are we try to hold intraday positions and try not to um, you know hold positions for too long given that markets really uh, change too rapidly. Uh, you could explore doing some trading yourself, but perhaps again uh, it's going to be very different, right? Manual trading versus uh, algo trading, systematic trading. So in a way, it can serve as uh, diversification, right? So you can consider having both if you really want to trade yourself. So we do have quite a quite a few savvy traders that come to us, they, they do FX themselves as well, but they are manual. So just, you know, by the virtue that we are doing a systematic trading, that will add another form of diversification to the portfolio. Right. Mm. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so we have another question from the audience. Um, it's, this is really quite uh, country specific. So the question goes, can you tell me what you expect China authorities to do in the backdrop of, you know, I guess, you know, the reopening has not shown as much, um, you know, gains as they were expecting. And if anything, I think the, the a lot of economies um, around China were expecting the bounce to be a lot uh, bigger and more impactful, but actually it has not delivered on that front. Um, do you think that, you know, there will be a, other changes coming and what could that possibly be? Maybe Gary, would you uh, yeah. like to try that? I can, yeah, I can make a start. I mean, I, I think number one is that, you know, we're, obviously we keep talking about economies, but we're talking about human beings. And I think given the profound lockdown that you had in China, it wasn't just going to be a straight line uh, of recovery. It, it, it never could be. Just because people's behaviors would have changed, they would be more circumspect about doing things. So I think that's, in essence, what's happened. We had the initial enthusiasm, and then people sit there going, you know what, I'm, I still don't have a huge amount of confidence. The second thing is that, ordinarily, China of the last 20 years would have just come with a massive fiscal package, and everyone would be happy, lots of government spending. But you know, the, the, you know, the presidency, the uh, President Xi Jinping has said that he does not want to see the economy go through that kind of uh, policy shift again, because money gets wasted, um, it's not spent effectively, and you just have to keep coming back with ever more greater amounts of money to spend, otherwise the economy loses momentum. So they're trying to keep to their structural change program, they're trying to keep to the repositioning of the economy. So quite frankly, we might just model through with around about five to five and a half percent growth with modest stimulus. I'm not so sure you're going to get that big spending announcement that the market might hope for. Ashley, would you like to comment on China? Uh, yeah, I can add on. Uh, actually, this morning, I just went for this Invest ASEAN conference uh, organized by Maybank. And the prof there's this professor Tan, uh, economies, uh, e economic professor at, at NTU, and we're just sharing this uh, example of how uh, the COVID has. So he used the analogy of like, uh, imagine you have a car that's been sitting there for two to three years and you're not using it, and right now what's happening is the battery is flat, <laughs> and and it, yeah, and if you have not used it, uh, you know it takes time to just jump start the engine again. So it's just hoping for this stimulus package to come in where, you know, that can really kickstart the engine and get it running. Because what's happening is a lot of people are still not spending. Um, they are, they, they, the, the, I think that whole uh, COVID lockdown has a lot more uh, serious effect, right, on, 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 on all the consumers' behavior. And they rather still just uh, save and not spend, just waiting for markets to, to have more confidence in the market first. So I would think, yeah, they need to jumpstart the engine somehow. Yeah, and I think um, you know, confidence is always a, a big issue when you're mm. looking at uh, you know signs of recovery, right? It's mm. uh, but it's driven by you know market confidence or investor confidence or lack thereof. Mm. Yeah. So I there is a question here on um the views on private market investments given today's backdrop, and I think. So I will take this question more because it's a nice segue to another question that's somewhat, um, you know, interrelated to this, right? So obviously, uh, you know, being a digital investment trading platform that specializes in private market, I'm a strong advocate for um, more investments going to the private uh, markets in general. But I'm not the only one, right? If you look at all the stats that has been published, it's been very clear, especially through, even in the last three years through the COVID crisis, I think a lot of people have realized that private markets is actually what's growing much faster than public markets, you know, something like twice the speed of um, uh, public markets. And in fact, the size of public mar uh, private markets has always been larger than, than public markets. It's just that because public markets are you know, public by nature, there's a lot of news and information about it, whereas private markets have always been a lot more opaque, number one, and number two, only accessible to institutional investors. Right, so um, some of the news may not get out into uh, you know the public realm or the wider audience because not many people, not as many people are interested to read about it. But if you think about things like um, the valuations and the ability to raise financing for projects for companies, I think uh, in the last three years there's been a clear shift um, 
in the private markets in general, investors or uh, I would say funds or investor groups are able to drive pricing better and able to have better control over their, their assets or their investments because they're able to structure these controls and these assessments into the entire you know, investment portfolio and thinking and strategy, right? So I, I feel that you know, ma private markets are only going to continue to grow. And that's why you know, we are in this space and we want to try and make the access to more people happen and increased the liquidity within private markets through the exchange. Because once you have an exchange, you have a benchmark, you have uh, NAV reporting on these private assets, be it a fund or you know, equity or a private loan, then you have the benchmark and you're able to get a sense of valuation. Because some, some of the reservations around private markets obviously is around valuations as well, right? But if anything, a lot of the investors this also understand that private markets have actually held up better in terms of valuation in the last three years compared to the public markets. Um, and this is obviously backed up by things like, you know, if you're holding real estate, you know, valuation reports, right? Or if the underlying, um, it's a fund, then obviously they need to mark to market whatever their investment portfolio is in. So I'm still very much a proponent and as I said, this leads on to the next question quite nicely, which is, what do you think is the optimal mix of FX versus alternative assets in a portfolio? And I would say that alternative assets are a very large definition here. Um, it includes everything from you know, real estate, um, you know, private markets uh, like credits, uh, private funds, private equity, venture capital um, that we do. But I think this is a good question that I would throw to Gary. Yeah, I would. I mean, I would take the experience of uh, of the big institutional money managers around the world. And as a private client, why can't you be like them? And uh, typically, they have somewhere between thirty and forty percent allocation to alternative investments. Now, that might include real estate, but it also includes the private credit markets, which have got enormous um, growth in recent years. So, I would say aspirationally, we need to be thinking about that because I think that would improve the ret risk return characteristics of any portfolio that starts life with just equities and bonds. Okay, thank you. There's a question here for Ashley. It comes from a long-term stock investor. And there's a person that says they're, you know, there's a long bias in that investment strategy in general, but they're new to FX. What are the challenges and limitations of forecasting currency markets accurately? So I guess, yeah, this is yeah. a question. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think this point, Gary covered it earlier on as well, that um, given the FX is quite uh, closely correlated to the rates um, environment, and if markets are, you know, always, central banks are always repricing, uh, changing their, 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 their decision, um, it actually could make it quite hard um, to kind of have a, to, to trade this long term. So that's why for us, we prefer to just do uh, more intraday positions, uh, having a more short to midterm view in terms of uh, the outlook and direction. And But again, those levels I shared earlier actually has um, not really relevant to our positions in our fund uh, because we are mostly model driven. Right? So um, yeah. So how do, how does the the fund actually react to um events like um, you know when there's more po geopolitical risks um and events unfolding? We actually filter out um some of this uh, high impact uh, events. So let's say uh, North Ontario FOMC, we actually will kind of pause uh, the signals from entering into the our master portfolio. So we rather just choose to be more conservative and not be caught you know. A, uh, in either side of the market. Yeah, so we take a more uh, conservative approach to that. But for now, actually, uh, in terms of positioning, um, actually more volatility is good for us. Otherwise, the worst we can happen is basically we have no trades. But again, cash is a position as well, right? So I think in today's market, it's better to be conservative than uh, too aggressive in your position. Okay, we've got a question very specific to China. Um, says Blinken's recent visit to China seems to be seems to be a positive signal for the U.S.-China relations. Is this a flash in the pan, or what do you think are the implications for investors? Gary, would you like to have a go at this one? 
Yeah, I must say I was pleased to wake up to the headlines this morning that, um, that both sides seem to be getting on and seem to be having a constructive dialogue. Um, some of the rhetoric we've been seeing, and I have to say particularly from the US side, which has obviously been very political ahead of uh, a key election next year, had just got to a level which was uh, where people were talking nonsense. So I think there's a genuine push on both sides to calm everything down because at the end of the day, this is, this is not just about looking to be the biggest guy in the playground. It's about trying to bring a calm to the global geopolitical scene, which allows for trade and growth in any economy. So I think both of them were finding that the impact of recent rhetoric was bad news for their economy, respective economies. It was dampening global growth. It was dampening investor confidence. And I think I'm hopeful that out of what we've just seen is that... Uh, Indeed, we may even see the two leaders of both countries meet each other quite soon in order to follow on from the positiveness of the most recent uh, sessions which have been seen to have. And that can only be good for global growth and the markets. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think we probably have only time for maybe two more questions. So I'm going to have to be quite selective about what we address. I think um, maybe something that's quite relevant and but a bit more general is um, climate change. I know it's something that keeps popping up. We see that all in the news almost every day in some way or form. Um, I'd like to get you know both your views on you know what do you think these efforts that uh, the various countries are making for climate change? What impact does it have on the global economic growth and business opportunities? You know, looking forward in the next. 18 months to two years, or even beyond. Gary, would you like to go have a go with that? Before oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could we could be on for hours on this topic. I, I mean, I just think that, uh, that people, and we've seen this profoundly over just the last uh, decade, are underestimating the impact of, um, of the lack of investment in ESG in the past and uh, rapidly trying to catch up, but not quickly enough. And I, I was talking to someone in real estate this morning. They said you know, they bought a building, they made it as green as they possibly thought they could. And then you know, two years later, they've got an enormous new investment to do in order to bring it up to the new regulations. So I think that there's definitely a cost um, to the markets from this. There is a, a movement of resources away from near-term growth to long-term growth and long-term sustainability. So I don't think we're really quite there yet in terms of people's understanding of the true challenges that we've got. And I think it will come out, come to play out more in the market. So if you're investing in equities, make sure you've got at least one mind on ESG as a, as a concept. And even in the bond markets, you know, look at the underlying credit, underlying companies and say, are, are these companies running a sustainable strategy? And last point is, you know, the interesting point about the recent rally in Japanese market, it's all those companies that are good at corporate governance. And all those companies that are good at corporate governance typically are also good at ESG. So, you know, that's been quite profound that investors in moving back into the Japanese market have done it in an ESG way. Mm. Yeah, so the, I, I am curious though, you know, does any of these um, ESG related um, considerations impact the currency markets at all? Ashley, do you see any of that? Uh, not really, but I do get, I, interesting on, on this point actually, just last week, uh, an Australian distributor was chatting with me and asking if I was ESG qualified. I'm like, <laughs> never thought of it. Given I'm just trading okay. FX and gold, I'm like, uh, I was like, okay, I'll go explore getting a you know certification, I guess, a, a qualification in ESG, just because right now what's happening, at least on the allocator side, is they do have funds that is designated for ESG specific, you know, the mandates are specific for ESG. Uh, investments. So they are just telling me that maybe I could go consider this PRI, uh, some responsible well, investments that of. But also <laughs> maybe maybe from the angle of yeah. you know the counterparties that you use when you do mm. your trading, right? Um, especially let's say for example on the gold side or any of your the majors that you're trading, you know, do any of the counterparties does is there? Do you even think about screening them for any of their you know reporting and sustainability records, for example? Honestly, I haven't haven't thought much about that but given that this conversation is coming up really strongly recently so it's definitely something we are looking looking at yeah going for this PRI qualification yeah okay okay 
Well, okay, thank you very much. I think uh, it's time for us to wrap this up. So I would like to express sincere thanks on behalf of Aztecs to our two panelists, um, Gary and Ashley, once again. Um, so can I please ask the audience to uh, complete our survey at the end of this um, session? So thank you once again very much for joining us this evening, and we'll look forward to the next session. We run these educational webinars on almost a monthly basis, so I hope to see you the next time around. And until then, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Gary and Ashley, for joining me today. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Thank you.